Greetings, I'm Matt Henderson, pastor of First Presbyterian Church of Clarksville, Georgia. This is our midweek connection, an opportunity to explore the theme of our current sermon series a little more than what our Sundays permit. Our theme is the signs of Jesus, which for some invoke faith, but in others, namely the Pharisees, invoke opposition. We've been walking through the Gospel of John, following the, the building plot of the Pharisees against Jesus. John lists his seven signs, his last one being the raising of Lazarus from the dead. The raising of Lazarus is not simply an opportunity for Jesus to show his divine power over death but also displays His love and compassion. It is love which draws Jesus into the center of the story, into the heart of the encounter of this family whom He loves. Jesus' compassion and love moves Him to respond in a personal and intimate manner. And in taking upon Himself the sorrow and pain of those whom He loves, Jesus reveals the promise of love and the promise of life available to us all. In the death of Lazarus, the one whom Jesus loved, we also see a precursor to Jesus' own death for us and for the world, those whom he loves. We also remember that Jesus will go on to say that no greater love has this than to lay one's life down for one's friends. We also saw in this story of the raising of Lazarus another perspective on the emotions of Jesus. As Jesus approaches the tomb, we're told he does so greatly disturbed and deeply moved. He's angry, in fact, not at his opponents, the Pharisees, not at the vacillating faith of the crowd seems apparent that his anger is directed at his adversary, death. And he boldly calls and proclaims that he alone has the ultimate power. There's emotion, there is passion, there is anger. Lazarus, come out. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in Jesus, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in Him will never die. Death has been defeated, and in Jesus, life is victorious. Well, our reflection today will pick up where we ended on Sunday with a few verses of overlap. We're in John 11, and I'm going to begin with the 41st verse. Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the crowd standing here, sake, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of this council and said, What are we to do? This man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone would believe in him. And the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. But one of them 
Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing, nothing at all. You do not understand that it is better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. John says, He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but to gather into one the dispersed children of God. So from that day, they planned to put Jesus to death. Jesus, therefore, John says, no longer walked about openly among the Jews, but went from there to a town called Ephraim in the region near the wilderness, and he remained there with his disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and were asking one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think? Surely he will not come to the festival, will he? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who knew where Jesus was should let them know so that they might arrest him. That's time. Again, this text illustrates the mysterious element of faith and belief. John says, many of the Jews believed in him, but some went to the Pharisees. And Christians throughout the centuries have marveled at how a single event or a witness could produce diametrically opposed responses in different groups of people. Is it that for some, their hearts are so hardened, their eyes so tightly closed, their pride and selfishness so heightened that there's no awareness of God's work, even, even when it comes and walks in their midst? John indicates that the Pharisees viewed Jesus' raising of Lazarus as a threat, a threat to the political order and stability that they work hard to maintain. You see, they're not just worried, it seems, about the threat that Jesus poses to their own power and control, but that Jesus might soon attract the attention of another power, the Roman Empire of which they seem to worry even greater. To them, this is not a religious or a theological matter. Is Jesus the divine Son of God, the Messiah? But it seems to be a political one. And it's ironic, isn't it? In the raising of Lazarus, Jesus demonstrates that the power of God is stronger than the power of death. And what other than death has any strength? And this demonstration is deeply troubling to all who have a stake in the status quo. And couldn't they though? Couldn't they also acknowledge that this power this power, Jesus, is stronger than the power of death and also stronger than any political adversary, stronger than their own feeble efforts to cling to power and control. Blindly, Caiaphas and the council, the Sanhedrin, respond by attempting to wield that same power of death, the same power that Jesus has called into question as they plot Jesus' execution. You see, the solution the high priest suggests, it is better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. John provides this amazing tidbit he provides a profound theological 
statement, an aside as the narrator. He says, Caiaphas prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation. Caiaphas, this high priest, serves as an unwitting prophet of Christ's redemption of the world. His words, they prefigure the grace-filled irony that Christ redeems the world precisely through the world's ultimate rejection of Him. Rejection of Him on the cross. God uses the very actions of those who most oppose the divine purposes in order to bring those purposes to fruition. Caiaphas thus provides us a reassuring glimpse of God working in and through and in spite of human error, of human ignorance, of human rebellion. This episode provides a concrete illustration of the claim that Paul will make in Romans chapter 8 that we know all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. Caiaphas manages only to further God's purpose despite his fervent opposition to Jesus. It seems that God knows exactly what God is doing. Isn't that what we believe? Jesus Christ came into the world to redeem our sinful, prideful, idolatrous ways. Jesus became one of us, taking on our flesh that we might be reconciled and transformed. God's plan used the sin, the pride, the idolatry of this world against itself to save the world. The power-clinging Pharisees, fearful of losing it all, are part of God's plan, are part of God's plan for salvation. Don't we acknowledge or at least struggle to make sense of this theologically that God's grace knows no limit, no boundary, no excuse? God's will will be done. And God's plan will come about. Don't we believe that God's Spirit can awaken even the hardest, most calloused of hearts? Does not the raising of Lazarus show that God's power knows no adversary, not even death can stand against God's plan? And even those who stand against God's plan, who seemingly try to work against God's effort, end up being part of the redemptive process. Jesus came into our world to be rejected, to be opposed, to be betrayed, to be denied. This was all part of God's plan. From the beginning, there is no thwarting of God's salvation plan. We'll be looking more at this on Sunday as we turn our attention next to Judas the one who will betray Jesus. From the beginning, each time John makes reference to Judas, we're reminded that he will be the one to betray Jesus. At looking at Judas, can we determine any of his inner motivation? Why is it that he will turn Jesus over to those who will kill him? But until then, the peace of Christ be with you.